Let's listen this morning to the word of the Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 4 is our lesson today. Uh, we're going to read this in two halves. We're going to read it, uh, the first half of this chapter at the beginning of the service, and then we'll read the second half just before the sermon. Listen now to the word of the Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 4. Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel. And as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat upon us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Shiloh, so that they go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people sent men to Shiloh and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who was enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a shout that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, what's all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? And when they learned that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. A god has come into the camp, they said. We're in trouble. Nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck down the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the desert. Be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you will be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were defeated, and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The Ark of God was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. May the Lord bless this morning the reading of his holy word. Now let's pray together. Father God, we thank you today for this lesson in life, for the privilege of worship, for the move of your spirit this morning, God. We want to be changed into the image of the only begotten of the Father. We want to be more like you. Oh, Spirit of God, make that happen, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Are you ready to do some worship this morning? To our Lord, Kim and Tony are going to lead us. Let's praise the Lord together. Has God been proved himself faithful in your life time and time again? He has done that over the ages, just not for you, but for all that believe that he is forever King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's sing together. Give thanks to the Lord and our God and King. His love is.
before that wonderfulness. Let's praise him. And then hymn number 497 says, I will praise him. Praise the Lamb of Jesus. Let's pray together. Blessed be the name of Jesus, the name above all names, the name that is sweet to our ears to hear, the name which has delivered us, and the God whose spirit is among us today. Oh, thank you, God, that you do not abandon us and leave us when we fail and trip and stumble and fall. That's not who you are. You're a God who woos us, who encourages us, who opens wide your arms and invites us to always come back to your feet, to your side, to your love. Oh, we do that again this morning, Lord. There's not a perfect person among us this morning. There's not a person here today, Lord, who can say in this last week that I have lived a perfect life. Father, how much we need your mercy and your grace. And we plead this morning that the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us from all unrighteousness, it is that blood today, Lord, that we lift our voices and we give you praise. We praise you. We praise you. The Lamb for sinners. How exciting it is to be in this house this morning, Lord, where you are. We covet now your presence. We covet your work in our lives. We don't want to leave this place the way in which you found us, Lord. We want you to change us. We want you, God, to touch us this morning by your power and by your love. We come to you this morning, the needy people. We give you our concerns and trials and difficulties which we face. We pray for the sick and the afflicted among us. We remember Liz Landreth recovering from her surgery. 
We thank you for Richard Finley being with us this morning. Continue to work a miracle in his life. We pray for Aaron Spivey. We pray for a rebuke of the devourer, that you will take this cancer from his body and for the miracle of new life in him. Thank you for Beverly, for the Spiveys. We pray that you would encourage them. We thank you this morning, Lord, that we could come to you and we could just give you our future. We could give you every difficulty, trial, and challenge that we face. And we do that now. We just lay it all before you. Most importantly, we lay now ourselves before you. We hold back nothing. We pray, Lord, that every inner chamber, every hidden thing of life that we think we can keep from you, take the key to every room. Take the key to us. We lay down before you. We thank you for what you've done. And we rededicate our lives to you once again. Now, Holy Spirit, we come before now the Word of God. It is powerful. It is eternal. It is your Word to us. Now, may we hear the Word and we ask. May we also be obedient to live it. For we pray now this morning all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I forget about it, because I always do, at the end of the service, let me just tell you right now. I hope you'll come back tonight at 6.30 uh, for our evening. We are beginning evening worship again on uh, Sunday evenings uh, here in the sanctuary. If you're wondering what we're doing, it's easy. Uh, we're going to be back in 1 Samuel. So there's so much to cover uh, in a book that you can't do it just on a Sunday morning. So we come back on Sunday night and we drill down uh, a, a lot deeper than we can in this brief 20, uh, 30 minutes that we may have on a Sunday morning. So come back, bring your Bibles with you, and we will uh, continue uh, in our lesson in 1 Samuel chapter 4. Discipleship uh, will begin in, in two weeks, not tonight, not next Sunday, which is Mother's Day, but on the 16th of May at 5.30, 5:30 uh, in the discipleship in the uh, in the flower room. Uh, we're beginning to call it the discipleship room, or the Becky Quinn class. In that room uh, is where we'll be meeting, but not tonight. We will meet in two weeks. Now, I was about to hand Tony her Bible back. She looks so. I, I need I need to read the rest of this chapter, and then you can uh, then you can come up and get it. First Samuel is where we're at. We read this morning the first half of that chapter. First Samuel chapter 4, uh, this was the last chapter of last year, uh, the last sermon that I preached before we uh, took uh, a year-long hiatus out of the sanctuary was from First Samuel chapter 4. I don't know how many of y'all remember that sermon. I had forgotten it. Game on, game over. Uh, we learned about spiritual warfare we're going to learn some more things this morning from 1 Samuel chapter 4. Let's look now at verse 12. The same day, a Benjaminite, Benjaminite ran from the battle line and went to Shiloh, his clothes torn, dust on his head. And when he arrived, there was Eli sitting on his chair by the side of the road, watching because his heart feared for the ark of God. When the man entered the town and told what had happened, the whole town sent up a cry. Eli heard the outcry and asked, what is the meaning of this uproar? The man hurried over to Eli. He was 98 years old. His eyes were set so that he could not see. He told Eli, I have just come from the battle line. I fled from it this very day. Eli asked, what happened? My son. The man who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistines, and the army has suffered heavy losses. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. When he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell backwards off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was 
broken and he died for he was an old man and he was heavy. He had led Israel for 40 years. His daughter-in-law, the wife of Phineas, was pregnant and near the time of delivery when she heard the news that the ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth but was overcome by her labor pains. And as she was dying, the women, the women attending her said, don't despair, you have given birth to a son. But she did not respond and she did not pay any attention. She named the boy Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because of the capture of the ark of God and the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband. In this precious bread of life, your word, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. The sermon this morning is entitled, Nothing More, Nothing Less, and Nothing Else. We've read 1 Samuel chapter 4, and when we come to chapter 4, after we've gone through chapters 1 through 3, we may well... Hannah, we story about this little boy Samuel uh, and his call of God, and then all of a sudden. We go from chapter 3 to chapter 4, and guess what? You don't see the name Samuel again. Chapter 5, forget it. The word Samuel's not even mentioned. 6, no Samuel. 4, 5, long chapters after all this beautiful stuff comes. All of a sudden, Samuel, it's like he falls off the page. Where did he go? What's going on? When we come into the fourth chapter of the book of 1 Samuel, man, does everything change. The, the spirit, the feel, the stories, so different. Why? Why? Well, that's worth asking. Well, there seems to be two reasons for these chapters, four, five, and six. Let me give you these as way of an introduction, uh, just kind of my thinking on this. First of all, I think the purpose of these several chapters is, first of all, is that they show us the world into which steps the young Samuel. So we've been introduced to Samuel in good measure, haven't we? But when we get to chapter four, now we're getting a schooling in the, in, to the nature of the world into which Samuel steps. And so we get a good picture here in four, five, and six of what's going on out there around us, the world into which you step today as you leave this place. The second reason I think we have these chapters is because they teach us how we are to and how we are not to live and minister and react and to respond to that world out there in which we live. And that leads us to the two main points of our lesson this morning. Let me give them both to you up front. Number one, in this world, a Christian will live differently, what I call a life 
of distinction, number two. And in this world, a Christian will live by faith in God. This is what I call a life of devotion. Or put another way, in this world, Christians will live lives of distinction because they are engaged day by day in a life of devotion to God. Without a life of devotion to God, a Christian will be unable to live a life of distinction. And so, in the headlines for these last several months, Hillsong United, all over the world, three of their largest congregations, Los Angeles, New Jersey, one in Australia, pastors falling like flies. It's like every week we, we hear of another one. And so last week, the story of the pastor in New Jersey, supposedly sending lewd photographs and vulgar texts to women within its congregation. The pastor of Hillsong, New Jersey. Some of those texts now have been published. And I read a couple of them this week. Cursing. Vulgarity. Lewdness. Nasty. Texts being sent with photographs. There was no distinction because there was no prior devotion. You can't have one without the other. By the way, and a little off topic here, there is a word that the Bible uses for people who attempt distinction without a prior devotion. You know what the word is? You know what we call people like that? Anybody? Hypocrite. Hypocrite. It's true. How uncomfortable I get anytime I speak on the distinctiveness of the Christian lifestyle versus the world. Because over the years, nearly every time I have done so, someone after church will inevitably come up to me and they will say this. They'll say, Preacher, it sounds to me like you're preaching works righteousness. And my response to that is no, no. Distinctive living does not lead to salvation, but it does result from it. Amen. So 1 Samuel 4, in this world, Christians will live lives of distinction because they are engaged day by day in lives of devotion to God. That's a principle. It comes right out of 1 Samuel chapter 4. Now, let's drill down a little deeper here. There are two ways in which Christians are different than non-Christians. They are different, first of all, constitutionally. And they are also different practically. Constitutionally. Invisible. Within them, there is something different. Practically, Visible, and for all to see, their lives are lived in a manner which is becoming of Jesus Christ. Let's talk about that for a second. How are Christians different constitutionally from those who are not Christians? Well, let me tell you, the Bible tells us, first of all, in two ways. First, Christians have been given a new nature. I was talking with someone here recently, uh, not in this church. In fact, don't even try, you don't even know them. So I know they're referring, the pastor's referring to them. No, you're not. But as I was talking with this person and seeing just uh, the sullen, uh, sad, defeated, I said to myself in my mind, I know what this person needs. They need a personality transplant. 
You ever met someone like that? Where you just think, man, they need a do-over. Aren't you glad you got a do-over when you became a Christian? Because what happened when you met Jesus Christ and you gave your life to him, he gave you a new nature. And the Bible speaks about this. I could, well, let me just give you a couple of scriptures. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. To put off the old self, Ephesians 4, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt with its deceitful, deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on what? The new self. That's what Christ gives to you and me. He gives to us a new nature and that makes us distinctive. But secondly, we are also constitutionally different because Christians have also been given supernatural power. And now we're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so Acts 1 and 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you're going to do some powerful stuff. You're going to be glowing, shining witnesses in this darkened world. Constitution. We're different than the world. We have been made that way invisibly. You can't see it. It's in here. There's a second way in which we are made different, and that is we are also made different practically. Christians are different. And you ask how so. I'm glad you asked. I've been collecting this in my notes as I've been driving and whatever I've been doing this week. And this is what I came up with. This is a small list. Are you ready? We Christians compared to the world, we spend differently. We budget practical stuff here. We budget differently. We work and labor differently as unto the Lord, says Scripture. We earn differently. My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. You work and labor and earn in a totally different Way. No worry at all. God's going to take care of you. He's going to take care of you. We possess differently. Everything that we own, we have as if it were not our own. What do you have that has not been given to you? We possess all things and nothing, the scriptures tells us. Isn't that great? We learn differently. Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 8, Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. We learn differently. You're not learning to be some kind of pencil-pushing geek showing off your knowledge to people. We learn differently for the service of others. And so we suffer differently. In fact, that's so much so that Paul had to create a totally distinctive word to describe the suffering of Christians. He says, we long suffer. That's Pauline. That's his word. Because it describes how it is that Christians suffer different. We can suffer long. And we suffer with the knowledge that it's leading righteously to a return of God, an investment that's being made. And so we talk differently. <laughs> this will remind us that that the way you talk should differ, right, from the world. But guess what? We listen differently. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. We wait differently. We eat differently. No blood in here, says Scripture. We dress differently. I will shut you off. You say, well, wait a second. 
Chuck, I've never heard that coming from you. Well, look, when it comes to dress and the way you dress and the, enti the attire that you buy, there is a scriptural variable that you must put into that decision of a purchase of clothing, which the Bible calls modesty. However that comes out, but it's different than the way the world looks at things. For someone who was on the road quite a bit this week, Christians drive differently. At least they should. We mourn differently, says Paul. Not as the world do we mourn. And so our businesses are different. Our marriages are different. Our dating is different. Our child rearing is different. Our attitudes are different. Our outlook is different. Our values are different. Our anger is different than sin not. Our priorities are different. Our sexuality and understanding of it. May I remind us one more time is different than the world. Clearly sexuality for the Christian, clearly demarcated, clearly monogamous, and clearly a gift only to those within marriage. Have you ever heard that before? Different. And then finally, Christians fight differently than the world and the struggle and the way in which we go about Fighting for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. And it changes. It governs. It tempers how we understand the struggles that we encounter with people or institutions or, or, or whoever in life. Well, Israel, at least in this last point, this is where they're going to get tripped up now. They didn't understand something about fighting because they were supposed to do things different than the world. By the way, for every instance, just what I've said to you where I inserted the word different, you could have just as easily inserted the word better. Our businesses are better, our marriages are better, our dating is better, our child rearing is better, our attitudes. Why would you want anything else than that? Why not just be different? And then receive all the benefits that come from it. The blessing of God, because we have been what had always been his intention since the creation of man, he was going to create for him a peculiar, different people that was going to reflect his values in this darkened world. Now, all of this then brings us to 1 Daniel 4, where we find these children of God, they get whooped. In chapter 4, the children of Israel, I mean, they get shamed. They get their plate licked clean twice in just a matter of a few days. What's wrong here? I mean, what's going on? Why? Why this massive defeat we find in 1 Samuel chapter 4? Well, there are two reasons for that. First of all, these are the Philistines, all right? So I was going to Birmingham a couple days ago, and I was taking 430 out towards Anniston, get up there to head to Birmingham. And as I was traveling down 430, that's a very busy highway, and there's a lot of big trucks. <laughs> you, you better be alert when you're driving on 430. And as I'm driving, 
I notice this little bitty, tiny box turtle. And he was making his way across Highway 41. And as, I, as I'm approaching this little turtle, I'm looking at him, I'm, begin, I'm almost thinking I need to stop the car and help the poor thing across. But I, but I began to think to myself, I, I wanted to say to that turtle, turtle, what are you doing out here? Whatever got into your mind? Did you honestly think that you're going to get across this road? All these trucks going by. Well, look, if you're going to fight with these guys in Israel, you better be ready. You better be prepared. And the best that the Israelites can come up with for a leader is frail, old, blind, and helpless Eli. You know, we read earlier, the pronouncement of judgment over the house of Eli had already been made. Did not these Israelites remember that as they go gallivant down into this battle? Phineas and Hophni, they're done for. We, we knew this was coming. Well, these elders who encouraged the battle stoked the fires of the battle. By the way, I just want to remind you, these are the same elders and leaders in Israel who in chapter 9, same group, they're the ones that will say, you know, they begin thinking this began to be a problem. You know, maybe we should be like all the other nations of the earth. And maybe we should get us a king. Same group is the group in chapter 4 that's saying, you know, I think we can take these Philistines. Um, come back tonight. I'm going to give you a lesson, a little historical lesson on the Philistines. Look, if you're going to go fight the Vikings, because that's who these were, if you're going to take on the Vikings, you better be ready to fight. Well, number two, these Israelites, we learned, though, in this story, they are not being and acting and living like and fighting like the children of God are supposed to. And we have a long history of this in the Bible of the children of Israel at war. So they know how to win against the odds when outnumbered, when all appears lost. You know, they've been there many times before. They know how to do this. And here, however, in 1 Samuel 4, we know there is not a single word mentioned of them, one, praying and seeking the Lord, two, not a single word of them hearing and listening for the directive word of the Lord, and number three, there is not a single mention of praise and worship and singing and the blowing of ram's horns and worship. None. Nowhere. No one even brings it up. They just said, sharpen the swords. Let's go out. And let's battle with these Philistines in this world. Christian, better learn something. We're not going to fight like them. We're not going to think like them. We're not going to act like them. And these Israelites made a dreadful mistake. Now that leads us into the final point this morning. In this world, a Christian will live differently. And finally this morning in this world, a Christian will live by faith in God. This is what I call a life of devotion. And this brings us then to the issue about what these prayerless, wordless, songless Israelites were doing on that hillside, carrying on their shoulders this Ark of the Covenant. What's going on here? Well, you see, they thought that somehow the Ark in this battle would bring leverage in this battle against their devotionless, sin-filled lives, Remember who's out there in the battle with, with them.
Shechem and Nazar. Hophni and Phineas are out there. Two of the most notorious sinners that we have in the Bible. We still have their names. And you know, we do this all the time. Leveraging religion to somehow make up for what is lacking in lives of devotion to God. We do it all the time. We wear arcs around our necks. We put marks on our t-shirts. When I was in the waiting room this week with Liz, I noticed this woman wearing a Christian t-shirt. I mean, it was just like emblazoned with what, you know, if I've told you before, if you're gonna put a Christian bumper sticker on your car, will you please, 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 please drive like a Christian? I beg you. But if you're gonna wear a Christian t-shirt, And you don't need to get red in the face and yell at that poor attendant who's doing her job and trying to bring some administration as to who can go visit and who cannot visit. You don't need to blister them. Well, we do it all the time. We leverage religion to somehow make up for what's lacking of our devotion to the Lord. Listen. If that's what you do, if that's how you're living, you better, you better read 1 Samuel chapter 4 because I'm telling you what's headed your way in your life. You are headed to defeat and destruction because the Lord's name will not be used in vain. Well, so here then is finally revealed the true heart of the matter with these children of God. Because there is one above all most important way in which Christians are to live differently than the world. I want to tell you what it is. It is this. Christians will live their lives day by day, moment by moment, challenge by challenge with absolute total trust and faith in their God. And anything else we try to substitute in there is going to bring to us trouble. You know, I think it's arguable that the most distinctive characteristic of a Christian is this very matter. You, Christian, are to put your faith not in anything else in this world, not even in religion. We are to trust in our God. You know, that's the irony of this ark business what they did. I'll tell you why. Because the ark was a symbol. It was, it was full of symbolism. So if they would have taken the cover off that ark, they would have found three things. There would have been Aaron's budding staff. Here's a little lesson in the ark of the covenant. In it was Aaron's budding staff. So you got to go back to the book of Numbers. And if you go to number 17, there's that story about who of the tribes of Israel were going to be chosen to be the priests of God and the one whose staff, the family, the tribe whose staff was there and dying would begin to miraculously bud and bloom. That would be God's signal. And it was given to Aaron and the Levites. That staff that he held that day was in that Ark of the Covenant. There was also the tablets of stone from Moses. And so the story, you know, in Exodus 34, where God inscribes the Ten Commandments on those two tablets, there in the Ark of the Covenant. And then finally, there's a jar of manna. And so that takes us back to Exodus 16, Numbers 11. And you know the story in the wilderness wanderings how it is that the Lord so miraculously he provided. Now, there they are. 
There is a staff of stone, the stone tablets and the manna. The staff, he had called, chosen, they should rejoice. The tablets of stone, he had commanded, they should obey. And then the manna, he provides for them. They should always trust. That was in the Ark of the Covenant that these crazy Israelites are carrying on their shoulders without a word of prayer, not even remembering what it was that the Ark symbolized. They should have trusted the Lord, but they decided to do it in their own way. Well, do you love me? I'm just, I'm asking you. Do you love Jesus Christ? Do you know him? And then one final question. Do you really trust him with your life? And your future? It's the most characteristic thing that distinguishes the life of a Christian. At a meeting of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, Bobby Richardson, former New York Yankees second baseman, was invited to give the prayer for that meeting. And he offered a prayer. And this is what he prayed. Simple, short, all but listen. This is what he prayed for those kids that day. Dear God, he said, your will Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. Amen. If we could all just pray and really mean it, we're just going to trust you, Lord, with our lives and where we are. Why? First Samuel 4 through 6. They show us the world into which steps the young Samuel. They teach us how we are to and not to live and minister and react and respond to the world in which we live and in this world. A Christian will live differently. We call that a life of distinction. And in this world, a Christian will live by faith in God. We call that a life of devotion. Our Father, we thank you this morning for this lesson in 1 Samuel. It is a lesson that calls us to discipleship. It calls us to, us to reevaluate the priorities of our lives. It makes us examine the distinctiveness of our lives compared to those who have never called upon the name of the Lord. It causes us to ask how much we really know, love, and oh God, how much we really trust you in our lives. I, I pray this morning for all who are gathered here. I, I'm praying for the work of the Holy Spirit in every single heart that's listening to me today. I, that, Lord, I pray for this miracle. Would nobody be excused from what is about to happen? Speak to our hearts, God, about our lives. Speak to our hearts, Lord, about our love for you, our knowledge of you. And help us, I pray, regardless of what we are facing today. May we trust you, Lord. Your word, your will, and your way, I ask in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me this morning as Ken and Tony are going to lead us in a song of rededication? I pray for the Lord not to excuse any of you. I believe him by faith that that's what he's about to do. The Lord is speaking to you. I believe this in some particular way. What is it? What is it?
let's trust him. Let's get into him, shall we? In these next few minutes, as we're singing, this is your opportunity. Lay it at the feet of the Lord and be a victorious Christian in this world. Full struggle. It can happen if we trust Him. Okay. Forgive me if I would ever sit at that precious sight of yours and be indifferent. We pray this morning that as we are drawn nearer to you and nearer to your heart, that our hearts, God, would be so warmed and would begin to pump with such vigor for the gospel and for service to you, Lord, that everyone around will, will look at our lives and they will know something's different. Father, it's because you saved us and it's because you filled us with your spirit. We are here today ready to leave this place and to go forth out into the world, out to battle. Now, Lord, may we not battle and struggle as the world, we learn the lessons of 1 Samuel 4. May we trust you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you guys. It's so good being in this place. I don't know why. Maybe I'm just getting more religious as I get old. But I just like it in here. Pews. Whoever would have thought Chuck Anderson, some hippie from South Texas, would love a pew. I love this building, but more than all, I love the people in it. I love all of you. God be with you. We'll see you tonight at 6.30. We're going to keep on in 1 Samuel chapter 4. You're dismissed this morning. Love each other.